Realism is the practice of accepting a situation as it is. What you're saying is what you see is what you get. But what you see is not what I get. They call me lucky. President Roosevelt escaped. How does a hundred-year-old tortoise escape? I hope he turns up soon, for Howard's sake. I got this anxiety attack. I fell. Lucky fell down. Let's not make a production out of it. No sign of concussion. Lungs are great, even though you smoke. You get much exercise. I walk around all the time. I do five yoga exercises every day. Nice outfit there, cowboy. I was scared to death. I started thinking there's nothing out there. It's all black. The void. Este amor apasionado anda torvo el borrotado por momentos se quiere. Do you have any kids, Lucky? None that I'm totally sure on. <laughs> you know, most people don't get to where you are. They never get to the moment that you're in right now, where you have the ability to witness what you're going through and clearly examine it. I know the truth, and the yeah. truth matters. And you have to face that and accept it. There are some things in this universe, ladies and gentlemen, that are bigger than all of us. And a tortoise is one of them. And very good today. So you get one of these. What, what do I do with this to get up my ass? How about you just suck it? So let's thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, I loved your film. Thank you. I, I, I've all, I've always loved Harry Dean Stanton, and uh, I felt like there was wonderful uh, homages to the to his work of the past, but then also there was just this beautiful story of a man dealing with mortality, and yeah. I thought you did yeah. it. Wonderfully and comically and sensitively, and uh, it was a really beautiful film. Congratulations! Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's your first film. Yeah, first film as a director. Yeah. Oh, you're not. No, I've done a kidding. few things before. A couple things. You might. I don't know. Maybe. You know. I have no idea. I have no check, idea who you are. There's this thing called Internet Media Database. Right. That you know you can look it up if you like. Okay, let's just cut the interview. I'm gonna yeah, go take thanks. a look Good right night, now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> no, stick around. We're gonna come back after. Oh, I cool. Look. Okay. Uh, so tell me, <laughs> what made uh, what made Lucky be the first film that you directed? Had you always wanted to direct? Well, I've been wanting to direct for a long while, and uh, I was, uh, you know, I've been looking for a way to get into that chair. It's uh, it's quite a bit of leverage. So uh, when I when this came up as an opportunity, it seemed kind of perfect. I also wanted to. You know, I loved the script. I thought it was so, so, uh, such a great story about somebody who finally, maybe, you know, maybe at a very late point in his life realizes he doesn't necessarily have years left. He has, you know, weeks and months left. Yeah. And uh, it even was... though there's nothing wrong with him, you know. <laughs> I kind of liked that, like not adding like actual uh, anything that was sort of causing him to die. So no, most he... movies would be like, oh, I'm dying. Yes, and, and then everything. Thing. No, there was literally like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. What, did And the writers wrote it for Harry Dean Stanton, right? Yes, it was uh, conceived from the very beginning as something for Harry. Uh, Logan Sparks, one of the co-writers, had been working with Harry for 15 years as his assistant. And, and Drago Samonja had known Harry probably for, I don't know, 12, 12 years. Something Harry's like assistant. Uh, yeah, uh, Logan was Harry Dean's assistant, yeah. Just to be a fly on the wall for Harry Dean's Absolutely, assistant. Absolutely, right. what that was like. Yeah, that was quite the life. So what was it like, you know, you approached, had they already had Harry Dean on and then it, it came to you to, to be the director? Or how did you get on board? That was exactly how it happened. What happened was they uh, started the script and they, they finished the first draft and asked if, uh, uh, Drago asked me if I wanted to act in the movie. And uh, I read it and really liked it and said, well, four days with Harry Dean, that'd be fun. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And then a couple of months later, they called me and said, listen, we know you've been wanting to direct and we're just wondering, would you be interested in directing this? And so um, I was in a, uh, I was in a long, so I said, well, let's talk tomorrow. So I, I was down in Atlanta working on The Founder uh, and I was in a laundromat doing my laundry. I, uh, ironically, it was the a laundromat that's featured in Baby Driver. <laughs> you know, so I'm st st didn't, it looked a lot prettier in Baby Driver. Anyway, uh, I was, uh, so I basically told them what I thought that the movie should look like and how to, you know, attack the movie visually. And they agreed, and we started working on the scripts to kind of um, tighten and incorporate those elements. 
and then uh, we we were able to get the movie made in short order. You know, we, we were which we were fortunate for because, you know, um, when your lead is eighty nine, you really want to go. You really got to go. <laughs> So Harry was 89 when you guys shot it. He yeah. just um, he turned 90 a week after we finished production. And he just passed away last week, two weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, right? a week ago Friday. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. You wrote a, a beautiful obituary about him in uh, IndieWire published it. Yeah, thank you. It was really about uh, his acting and, and what his tools were. He, he was insistent that he was only playing Harry Dean Stanton which I don't agree with, but then again, uh, whatever he was doing, it worked. How do you direct someone like that on set who is consistent that they're, they're not acting? Or do, you, do you direct them? Do you just put the camera on them where you want the camera to be? And oh, no, no, go? no. You definitely, no, you'd be, you, you definitely have to direct. I mean, the thing is that uh, you trust that the actor's going to go in the right direction, right? That's why you wanted him to do it in the first place. And in this case, it was his, you know, it was inspired by him. So you, you, you know, it was going to go it was going to go the, in the direction that, already in the direction that you kind of want it to go. It's a matter of trying to f create a context because so many of the stories and so many of the things that happen in the movie are inspired or based on or actually autobiographical to Harry Dean's life. But they're not used in the same way in the movie. They're, they're in, a in a fictional context of, a, of an, uh, a man who lives in a small Arizona town just at the edge of the desert and he's kind of a hermit, which is nothing like Harry Dean's life. So it was taking all of Harry Dean's stories and life choices and mixing them up and putting them into a different context. So there was a lot of discussion between he and I of where exactly in the movie is this thing happening now? Because I mean, I just did, I had just done an 18 day shoot myself as an actor, and I was in very similar circumstances in terms of, uh, okay, I've walked into this door six times. Where in the movie is this walking into the door? And so that's the kind of work we did. And then it was about modulation and, you know, choice making and all that stuff. And, you know, he was, he was, uh, he was fierce about this need to be truthful. So you had to earn that, you had to earn that, um, uh, you know, you had to earn your notes, which I, I thought was great because... What do you mean earn your notes? Well, you had to make sure that it was in... The, you had to make sure you were right. Yeah. And you also had to make sure that, that what you were saying was absolutely needed for the scene. Otherwise, he would wonder why he was doing it. Um, and I, I think that had to do with a lot of things about this particular movie. A lot of it had to do with he was revealing so much. You know, when we went to Locarno, this was before Harry died. Jean Moreau had died this year. She's a wonderful actress and amazing, amazing artist. And she, she said, actors reveal. And that's what he was doing in this movie. He was revealing himself in such a, a fundamentally intimate way that a lot of it had to do with taking that intimacy and that vulnerability in a personal way and using it in the material in the way that we both wanted. Was there ever a moment where he felt uh, almost too much ownership over some of the stuff that was happening in the movie and you, you had to kind of loosen him up a little well, bit? Well, there was one moment There was one moment where I heard about this kind of post facto, pretty close to post facto, was uh, we were getting ready to shoot in his house the following morning. We were going to do the story that's in the movie about the Mockingbird, which is from his life. Uh, as a young man, and it's a lovely story, it's a, and he's told it before in, uh, in you know, bar context and life context, and also in uh, partly fiction, the, uh, the documentary about his life uh, and about him. And um, so he called, uh, like he called Logan, I think, or Drago, he called one of them and said, hey man, you know, uh, I don't think I'm gonna do that tomorrow. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I wanna tell that story. <laughs> And they're like, uh, uh, oh, um, okay. And they just kind of talked him down. You know, he goes, yeah, it's too much. I don't want people to know that. I don't want people to know that about me. And, and uh, slowly they kind of talked him down. And he gets to the set and we're going to shoot it. And I was like, hey, we're, we're ready, right? And, and Logan goes, yeah, but, you know, I mean, he almost didn't want to do it. You know, he just, we just barely got him here, frankly. And then he came in and he sat down and he told the story. And I said, you know, Harry, are we going to do this? You know, if we're going to get it in one, we can get it in one, and, you know, and he did. He, he, he told what you see in the movie, obviously, there are no cuts in it. It's, it's a single shot, and uh, it was beautiful, and I said, listen, I'm, I'm happy. If, and he goes, um, no, I think I, I think I want another. And with Harry Dean, when you wanted another take, it, when you said, Harry, I think we want another, he goes, what was wrong with the last one? <laughs> 
So this was a surprise. Well, he's always said that he doesn't, he doesn't really like working. Yeah, I think uh, uh, there was a great quote of his that Logan had, which was, he likes to, re- he likes to take it easy and then rest after. You know, I mean, uh, do nothing and rest after. So, uh, you know, no, he, didn't, he, didn't really, he doesn't really like to work. But, I mean, at 89, you know, he's pretty much proved everything he needed to prove. So then he did another one, and it was as beautiful as the first one. And then he asked for one more. He did it three times, and I could have used any of the three. They were fantastic. I want to go back to when you uh, sort of pitched your ideas for the film visually. Mm-hmm. What, how did, what, what was the pitch? What were you thinking? Well, uh, I mean, we had talked about a few movies while we, while we were discussing the possibility of, of me doing it. And I said, I said, I think this is what the movie is, and I think is what it should look like. It has, uh, and I mentioned straight out the movies that they had been imagining, Last Picture Show and, um, you know, Mystery Train and... Uh, and uh, um, that one came a little bit later. But I also, uh, and along with that one, uh, um, obviously Paris, Texas is, is well, the a walking part of, through the, the desert, walking, I mean. Actually, like, absolutely, yeah. the walking through the desert. I mean, to see that person walk through the desert again, you know, what, in 1984, so 2016, so it's, you know, 32 years later. Yeah. I see, uh, I had thought while, he, while I was watching the movie that you were intentionally homaging certain movies that he was in by having Lynch in there, by having him walk across the desert, and, or at least just trying to call to attention or a little... Uh, like, well, you can't ignore his filmography, right? You can't ignore... Uh, audiences who have any understanding of his work, will. you can't ignore the fact that they're going to come in with a preconceived notion, but you also can't make it just simply for Harry Dean Stanton fans. You have to make a movie that somebody who doesn't know Harry Dean Stanton at all would be able to follow. So, um, so I didn't want it to be precious. Nobody wanted it to be precious, but it's also a visual film. So the other, the other thing we talked about was the vistas and trying to create a sense of that kind of John Ford space. like, uh, And we, we were able to capture that in, in, in a way that r- should have been impossible with our time and our budget level. Yeah, well, how much time did you shoot the film in? We had 18 days. We shot 17 days in Los Angeles and then two half days in Arizona and all of the desert things that you see. This is in, this is in Piru, California, but uh, most of the desert things you see are, uh, are in those two half days, the tortoise and all the other things that happen in the desert. That's wild. Yeah. Was that difficult as a first-time director? Yes. Like- <laughs> yes, absolutely it was. It was very hard. No, no. I mean, look, I, 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 I had, I had such great help and such great support, and everybody had come to play with Harry Dean and work with Harry Dean. So there were people who were sleeping on couches from Roanoke, Virginia, so they could be on the the onset dresser because they love Harry Dean so much. It was, it was a labor of love from beginning to end, and it was a party to some degree for him because there are people in the movie, um, Logan Sparks' wife. Amy's in the movie, and his mother's in the movie. These people Harry Dean knows really well. Mouse is a really good friend of his. David is a really good friend of his. Ed Begley's a really good friend of his. They were, it was filled with people who love him very much. And it was also the intention to create a movie. It wasn't just to create this party. It was to create a story about, and to get people to, to the point where they're seeing the world in the way that Harry Dean, to some degree, inspired the writers to look at the world. What was it like, uh, or how did you cast David Lynch? Well, uh, we were looking for somebody to play Howard, and we were talking about a lot of people, and we'd gone out to a couple of people who couldn't do it for, for a, uh, you know, a few reasons. And then, um, actually, uh, Harry said to Logan, uh, have you talked to David? What about David? And uh, Logan was like, you think he'll, he'd do it? He goes, why don't you ask? So Logan called me and said, what do you think about David? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Let's see if he can do it. Because I'd seen him act before mm-hmm. and seen him act in things that he didn't direct. Oh. So I knew that you know, I'd seen Louis. He was on oh, Louis. Yeah, that's right. So I'd seen that he, he had acted in things when he wanted to. So that was good. And, and I also liked what I saw. And also their relationship in this documentary where he comes to sit in Harry Dean's house and and ask questions in partly fiction. It's like a pot-bellied stove of warmth between them. They just love each other so much, and that was so important to the movie that Howard, when Howard wasn't there, you felt the absence of that warmth. Yeah. And uh, and so I knew, it, uh, you know, I had a, a really good sense that it would work. So he called, uh, Logan called Michael, uh, 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 the longtime assistant of, of David. They've known each other for years. And it just kind of, it took a while to, to boat that Marlin, but we finally pulled it into the boat, yeah. What's it like being a uh, first-time director and directing David Lynch? 
Um, I was, he was extraordinarily respectful and, uh, of the position I was in and, and the work that I needed to do. And he, was, uh, he was, came prepared and, uh, and treated it as an actor, completely and utterly as an actor. Do you think, uh, I mean, you've acted in so much for, for, for quite some time now. Do you think acting on so many different sets with so many brilliant directors is really what prepared you for how to handle a set and how to run this? Or did uh, you still feel like most directors feel on their first movie and most, I think maybe any movie, woefully unprepared no matter what? Well, I don't think you can really completely prepare for the experience. I certainly had, uh, I had advantages and disadvantages from coming from the acting portion of it. Um, Things in post-production were intellectual for the most part for me. I, I understood what they were, but I'd, I had never done them. So those things were new to me. And pre-production I had a, a, a better understanding of because I'd, I'd grown up in the theater as an actor, so I knew what that looked like. I knew the conversations that designers and directors have. And also I'd been through uh, shadowing certain directors in various circumstances. Uh, particularly had, uh, on television, I, I followed a couple of people around on television as I was trying to get, as I was trying to, yes, when I decided to, uh, to try to direct, and so I'd had a sense of what pre-production looked like in a television sense, which isn't the same as, yeah. as uh, a feature, but I, I kind of got that idea, uh, and then uh, the and the production portion of it, being on the set, watching actors work, being the way the the way a scene is cut up into shots all those things were things i was very familiar with so that was not a that was not a surprise to me but uh the first even even with all that the first day we rehearsed the scene it was uh, it was with ed begley and and harry dean in the doctor's office and we had rehearsed it and we set up the first shot and asked harry to come in and he sat down on the on the on the um uh examination table and uh then uh everybody quieted down as they do on sets and said uh, rolling speed and nothing happened and n nobody said anything and then finally goes Harry says well say action man that's that's why you're doing the deal right I mean that's why you're doing it <laughs> I just completely forgot I was the person to say that it's a hard thing to actually say. It's something that you actually have to get used to saying. Uh, you get to, used to it pretty quickly. Oh you got used to it pretty Oh yeah. You get used to it pretty quickly. Uh, I want to talk about some of your work uh, uh, as, as an actor. You know, right now you're on American Horror Story. Yeah. Or at least you had a, yeah. a you know, what is it been like? A reprise of, of uh, Twisty the Clown. Yeah. What did you think when you first got cast as Twisty the Clown? Well, uh, I got a call from my manager uh, and said, um, Ryan Murphy would like to talk to you. And you go, okay, that sounds good. And he calls and says, I'd like you to play the most terrifying clown in the history of television. And I said, sounds good so far, uh, but I, but I want to say that I, I don't want to play, I don't just want to play somebody who's stabbing somebody. I'm not interested in playing a Jason, you know? Uh, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. Trust me, trust me, this is, this goes somewhere. You got to just, you got to understand it's an arc and it's going to get somewhere and you'll be pleased with it. And I said, okay, I thought about it. I said, yeah, okay. Because I'd just seen his work in Normal Heart, mm -hmm. and it was so moving and so powerful, and I had seen his work on American Horror Story, though horror wasn't my thing, I'd seen episodes of it. And Nip Tuck and Glee, you know, I, I was familiar with him. And I, I thought, you know, I, he, he's earned my trust, so, uh, as an artist. And he didn't disappoint. The, it, it, was, uh, it was a beautiful arc, and beautifully written. So I was very happy to have done it. And then to reprise the role in the, in the ingenious way they brought him back in this, in, this, uh, in this season and to kind of amplify the, you know, the uh, color of phobia, the fear of clowns that this person has, you know, Sarah Paulson's character has, that it was, you couldn't do a season with clowns on that show and not reference the clown you created three years before. That would be just stupid. So um, they weren't stupid. <laughs> now uh, your your breakthrough role are arguably is Fargo, right? Like uh, yeah, you, absolutely. Uh, and that's such a sweet, warm. Yeah, he's really nice, right? Yeah, both of them are. They're incredibly yeah, they, nice, yeah. and you they have, love each other, and they don't kill anybody. And they have an incredibly warm, you know, one of the warmest endings I think in movie history, at least in like thriller history. It's a 
yeah. beautifully warm ending. It is, absolutely. What was it like to go from being sort of known for that and having that be a breakthrough role and then being very no, very well known for Zodiac afterwards, which is a completely different kind of part? Well, there was a few the steps. tenor of your career, yeah, There was like. obviously a few steps in between there because, yeah. you know, uh, when, I, when I was cast as Norm in Fargo, um, it, I, I loved playing that part, and, and it made me a legitimate film actor, which, uh, you know, I'd come from the stage. I was actually living in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the time. Oh, doing theater uh, in Doing theater at the, at the Guthrie. And Did they cast you from Minneapolis? Yeah, like, uh, it was uh, two-thirds of the cast of that movie are from Minneapolis. Cool. Um, so they, they, they really, it was a homegrown cast. And uh, uh, so... I did that movie, and it obviously was ridiculously successful, and they're brilliant, so that works. And Fran gets an Oscar, so that worked too. What was and it like uh, working with them, if you don't mind oh, me asking? Oh, I, I mean, you, from the page you saw what, you know, you could see the whole movie. And then when I saw the movie uh, cut together, it, Carter Burwell's score and the way they edited it and Roger Deakins shooting it, it just became deeper and more sorrowful than I ever imagined it would be. And then there's this warm relationship in the middle of the movie about two people who are just, are just the paragons of common decency. They're not smart. They're not, they're not incredibly, they're not, they're not handsome in, in a, you know, they're not beautiful. They're just, they just love each other. And, and that moment when she says, and it's such a beautiful day, like she's got the guy in the back, the guy's just, Peter Stormare is just uh, ground up Steve Buscemi and the wood chipper, and she says, and all for just a little bit of money. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, it was a great screenplay, and they did it beautifully, obviously, but uh, that created a circumstance where I could, I, I mean, people thought of me as a legitimate film actor, and I could get into rooms and not scare people, because that's a lot of it. They, they're relying on you to not be crazy and to be good when you show up, so... Um, <laughs> wait, wait, would you most actors show up and act a little crazy? No, sometimes? but I mean, but I mean, if you don't know somebody, if you don't call somebody for references, like, let's say you're going to say, I need a cabinet built. You don't just... You don't just pull somebody out of the yellow page and say "go to." You like call their call their references and go. Is this guy like totally nuts? I mean, because if he is, I don't want him in my house. And uh, also, um, I hope. I mean, he's going to actually build the cabinet that I want because this cabinet's important to me. Now, imagine that. That's what you're doing when you're hiring an actor. You're hiring somebody to. You're taking a risk that they're gonna they're gonna be good. And so you you know referral is a big part of the business and should be. But uh, so when I started working in other projects, uh, I found myself uh, staying in this really nice, warm world, even with some twists like Steve Carey, where I'm wearing a dress. He's really a nice guy. I mean, he's a terrific guy. And I, and I was kind of trying to find a way to uh, express in myself and express in the work uh, a level of, uh, of acceptance of human evil that I, I have, both inside myself and in other people. And, uh, and I got a job in a movie called Gothica, where um, it's arguably the worst person I've ever played. He's horrible, man. And, uh, and it was part of the way in which that corner was turned, and then, you, then, I could play, uh, then I could play people all over the spectrum of emotional life, and I wasn't, I wasn't just capturing one part of humanity and one part of what I wanted to talk about. Did it feel like after Gothica and Zodiac that you started getting cast even more so? On the yes, then I couldn't side? get any nice roles. <laughs> then, then nobody thought of me as a nice person. And then John like, Lee Hancock. Go watch Fargo. And I'm then John nice. Lee Hancock cast me in The, the Founder, and yeah. Mac McDonald is the sweetest man on earth. I mean, he, he couldn't be nicer. He loves his brother. He works hard. He's just a decent human being. And, uh, and that Ray Kroc. Uh, it was a tragic story for the for the McDonald brothers. And yes, film. it really was. It was it was to some degree tragic. Although it's also kind of weird that it's tragic because they were millionaires. Yeah. Like they were successful, and because Ray Kroc was success on steroids, they suddenly seem like losers. Yeah. But they weren't losers. That's the fun. That's the part about that movie that I love was uh, John Lee Hancock did not leave you with an easy answer in that movie. No. They're, 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 uh, they, they were great at what they were doing, but they, they didn't see what he saw. They didn't see what Ray Kroc saw as the possibility. Raw, uninhibited capitalism. Raw, uninhibited capitalism with complete and utter greed as the engine. They did not see that. They, they, had, they had capitalism with integrity. 
Capitalism with quality. Capitalism with service to their community. That's what they saw as capitalism. They saw it as chamber of commerce Republican capitalism. They did not see it as multinational corporations tearing apart the world like Godzilla's, but he did. And he changed the world because of it. Not necessarily for the better. Yeah, not necessarily for the better with him. Yeah. No. Uh, let's get some questions. But the San Diego Padres wouldn't exist without him, so there's that. That's true. Uh, who has a question? Hi. Um, you've, like Ricky mentioned, you've worked with some of the greatest directors in film history, Clint Eastwood, Martin Scorsese, John Woo, David Fincher, and I wanted to know what have you learned working with some of those directors when you started to do your first film as a director? Uh, it kind of falls into three levels, uh, three categories. One is uh, the simplest one to describe as being a really good host, right? Creating an atmosphere on the set that's creative, that people feel supported, that you make sure that the, the movie's moving in the direction. All of those people that you just mentioned did that really, really well. And there was, there was little or no ego dissent around that. Everybody was pulling in the same direction. In all the, circ in all the people you described, everybody I've worked with in that. The second one is to create the, um, what's the best way to put it? Um, to make sure that you, um, you can, uh, like David Fincher was a perfect example, and I am not at this, this is completely aspirational, which is to see the uh, equation of filmmaking from um, you know, the equipment you need, the time you need, the, the talents you need, the, um, the uh, designers you need, and the money you need to have, and the story you want to tell, all is in the same equation. And it was amazing to talk to David Fincher and hear him talk about it, and, and see somebody who knows, who sees it all as one single equation. Like the artistry of it and the budget of it do not, are not separated for him. And that's an incredible thing. I mean, I, I'm, still in a, I'm still aghast. We had a conversation walking back to the base camp and in five minutes he described how he could save 10 days. Like, I mean, it was incredible, uh, shocking. I was like, man, I don't know enough to do, even follow this. And then uh, the other part of it is the sense of um, making a movie, uh, of breaking it down into its component parts and knowing exactly what you need to get to get the story that you have. And that also takes uh, time and that's aspirational to me, you know, to understand, to understand the, uh, the, the rhythm of the movie so well that you can improv on the day when it's necessary, but you have a strong enough plan so you can get what you need anyway and not make it about the previous moment that you did your homework, but make it about right now. And among the many people that you described, it was so much fun to watch John Lee Hancock work and be on the set with him because he was so improvisational in terms of the shots that he chose, but he was always constantly thinking of how this was gonna go with the next scene and how this transition was gonna work and how he had in his mind this one transition but this would be much better and he was doing it on the day in that moment and that was, I mean, uh, that was like wow, when I, when I get to learn how to do that, I, I'm gonna be really happy with myself. What was your biggest challenge on, on, on making this film? It was, you a, as a director. I mean, it was a very challenging movie in terms of, in terms of schedule. So, and uh, you had two clocks, the time clock that we had, the, which, which was equated by the money that we had, but also the energy that, that your lead actor could, could have. Uh, and we, we were really um, very focused on that. I wanted to make sure that Harry could do the work that was necessary for him and not wear him out. We, we were able to schedule this 18 day shoot over five or six weeks and not not just in three weeks as you would in most circumstances. And we were able to do that, so we tried to make it manageable so we wouldn't have to have too many heavy things in one day, but sometimes you couldn't do that. Sometimes you had to load it on a little bit. And then the other thought part was the physical stuff because um, when Harry Dean was walking in Piru, California, when he was doing those walks, um, there was there's a lot of walking in the movie and um, and just from, action to cut, he walked three miles uh, in 90 degree heat. Uh, that would be exhausting for anybody. But for somebody of his age, man, he was tenacious. I mean, it, he, was, 
he's my hero, man. He was unbelievable. And it was true throughout the shoot. There were moments where he was exhausted and you would never know it from the, you would never know it from the dailies. You would never, it was, it was impressive. Uh, next question. Hi, Mr. Lynch. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, does having control as director of this film, does that make you want to direct other films in the future? Well, it's not really, I mean, yes, uh, I would like to direct again. I, I wouldn't necessarily equate it as control, but I, I, but I would say that I, I would like to direct again because there are things that, I, there are stories that I want to tell that can't be told with me in them, uh, you know, because I, there's not a part for me, right? <laughs> so I'd like to continue to do those things. Uh, and, and there may be other things that I'll be perfectly right for that I'll say, no, I, I think I'm right for this part. But like, I, I, we were talking before, I'm kind of, a, I'm kind of a, like a, I mean, I, I have scripts that I want to write I mean, direct rather, that I've written with my co-writer, Tess Clark, and I don't know that I'm ready to direct them. So uh, I may not, as a producer, go, let's call my number, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not precious about what I need to learn to get better at this job. I, I know that there's a lot I need to get better at, but I'm ambitious to try. I have to ask, what are the kinds of things that you feel like you're not ready to direct? I mean, is it like sort of approaches to sequence or action or? I, I think it, partly it's that. Partly it's there's there's certain kind of technical visual elements that are, that are still new to me. Yeah. Uh, that in some of these stories you'd have to have, um, you know, visual effects and and things like that, aerial shots and stuff that you can write and you can talk about and you can conceive of intellectually, but you wouldn't necessarily be the best person to to uh, I, I mean, I, I, I want to, and I want to learn how to do that, and it may be that I'll have to call my number before I'm ready, which is fine, but then I'll have to find the right people to help me. Yeah, get the right collaborators yeah, exactly, around you exactly that right. are willing to teach while also yeah, be, do it. Uh, I, I am not, you know, what I don't know, I'm perfectly happy with saying I don't know. Tell me how to do that. A lot of directors, I mean, that's a good thing. A lot of directors aren't willing to do that. You know? Well, I mean... Uh, scary thing to say that in front of your crew. That, I, I think it's a scary thing to say whenever, whenever you do it. But the great part, that's what, something that you, you have to say as an actor virtually every day you're working. Yeah. So you get used to going, okay, I'm failing now. So I could use some help. Where, where am I going wrong? Yeah. Uh, and, and if you're willing to ask that question, there are plenty of people who are willing to help you. I think I have time for one more question right here. Hey, John, thank Hi. you for your performances in thank the past. You. I've enjoyed them. As a camera person, I've asked these questions of many people, uh, other directors. Um, do you like the video village, or do you sometimes stay in eyeline sight of the actor? And I'm curious about your experiences of that in the past. And also, did you play music on the set like Peter Weir does? And those are my two questions, if you've experienced that on other movies or if you did that. I have not experienced the uh, the music on sets, uh, although I've heard of it, and I think it. I think in certain circumstances that would be a really good tool. Um, I think. Uh, I think in this circumstance it probably wasn't. The movie isn't filled with music. Does that make sense? So I, I didn't feel a sense that that was something that that we needed to keep the the atmosphere going. As a matter of fact, silence was much more. Uh, evocative for this particular movie. That being said, I didn't even consider it. <laughs> so, and as far as uh, where I was, I found being in Video Village as a, as a director to be limiting because I'm not close enough to the actor and the performance. That's what I was getting yeah, but, at. Yeah, but I'm also, I'm also completely aware that the, but the, the performance is being captured by the cameraman. So I need to see what they're seeing to see if the performance is working in the way that I could see it in my naked eye, and we could be we could be way off. So I used clamshells. You know, I used the the clamshell monitors to watch. But um, with Harry, there were a lot of times where I realized I hadn't watched the clamshell for the whole day because he was he was so mesmerizing. You were watching him. Yeah, I was watching him. Yeah, and so it was kind of a balance. And we had a wonderful d director of photography, Tim Shirstead, on this movie, and he was able to get a, a movie visually. You know, we, we had talked about an ambitious visual movie, and he was able to get that visual movie. And we really, with the time we had and with the with the budget we have, we really shouldn't have deserved that. So um, it's a beautiful film. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, film. and it was shot with anamorphic lenses, vintage anamorphic lenses, and it was shot. Uh, some of those lenses, we uh, we were walking around Panavision, and, I, and they showed me the set of lenses, and 
um, the people there, I said, do you have a list of every single movie that these, these lenses have been on. Yeah. And I was like, I'm sure that Harry's been shot with these lenses before. And they said, oh, yeah. Well, you want to know? And I was like, no, I don't think I, yeah, no, I, don't think compare, I do. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think I want to know what movie these lenses have seen him in. <laughs> then you'd be, you'd go back yeah, I'd be and like, that, and that would be in re- I'd be in reverb the whole time. Yeah. Well, John, uh, I love the film. Congratulations. Thank you. Lucky. How can people see it? It opens here in New York in, in L.A. Uh, the 29th of uh, September at the Quad, the Rose, and the Lincoln Plaza uptown here, and at the Arclight and the Landmark in Los Angeles. But on September 24th, all over the country, in about 60 art houses for Art House Movie Day, they are showing the film as part of that a part of that celebration of art house movies, right. and uh, Harry Dean Stanton's career is art house, art art house movies. So it's a, a fitting tribute that they're celebrating him on that day. And then the movie rolls out on uh, October sixth, and then October thirteenth in various markets, and uh, and hopefully when all of you tell your friends and when AOL broadcasts this to. 6.8 billion people. I'm correct about that audience, right? That is correct, Okay, yes. great. Uh, then, it's being broadcast right now. We're yeah, live. it's being broadcast right now to 6.8 billion people. Then maybe somebody will go. Uh, John, I look forward to the next film that you direct and the uh, next project that you're going to be acting in. Everybody, go see Lucky. It's a truly beautiful film, and it's Harry Dean Stanton's last movie. Yeah. You know? yeah. John Carroll Lynch, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.